What's the constant of world history? It's conflict. Given that there are people who are extremists, who are willing to die for their cause, is it likely that we will have attack on the United States of some significance? And I think that's very likely that we will. The major threat problems that we have today are a deteriorating economic environment globally, uh, the rise of new competitors, uh, competition for resources and political place, the press of uh, population expansion. If we don't have an alternative to fossil fuel, that's going to set up winners and losers. That'll set up conflict across the borders. The advent of these uh, weapons with mass and complex effects is probably the largest threat that anyone around the globe faces, and certainly that we, the United States, face. There are new nation states building very sophisticated weaponry that will threaten the United States, both in a strategic context and a tactical context. Just imagine, if you will, nuclear weapon in the hands of radicals. What do we do about that? I'd point as an example to North Korea and our inability to gauge exactly what they might do next. And a country like Pakistan, which has suffered uh, considerable instability in its surrounding regions. If the Iranians get a nuclear weapon, if they just demonstrate the detonation of a nuclear device in the Iranian desert, instantly there's an arms race, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East that will change the world order. The effects of weapons like uh, biological weapons are not merely uh, the cause of death. They are the cause of social anxiety and panic. Indeed, the future uh, is characterized by the complexity of many conditions and circumstances converging on us almost continuously. The threats that we face don't recognize boundaries, whether those are physical boundaries or organizational boundaries or agency boundaries. And every time we're inhibited in our response to those threats by our own boundaries, we've lessened our impact. And when we lessen our impact, we lessen our services to those decision makers and we ultimately affect our national security in a negative way. The consequence to the nation if we don't integrate intelligence, I believe, is simply that we will miss things. Uh, we won't uh, deliver the best possible solution set to our mission partners, whether that's the policymaker, the warfighter, or the first responder. This type of warfare today, the, the types of threats that we face require rapid simulation of information, rapid understanding and situation awareness, rapid decision. So if without integrated intelligence, it's like fighting with both hands tied behind your back, blindfold over your eyes. It's, it's uncertainty, it's poor decisions, it's delayed decisions, it's loss of opportunity, it's loss of momentum. So the way you are most likely to recognize the content, the substance, the early warning, the value of information is if you integrate it in the most comprehensive way. And that means that you understand sensors and capabilities, you understand collection, you understand the question, you understand the needs, potential threats, and you're putting that in information together in a way that the, the sum is significantly larger, more valuable, more useful than the individual parts. If you look at a place like Afghanistan and you don't understand those tribal connections, you don't understand what crops are grown where, if you don't understand how people get products to market, how they communicate, who interfaces with who, then you can't possibly understand the complexities of the insurgency that grows from that. We can no longer afford to make the kind of mistakes that we've made in the past. I don't think we could have afforded to make them in the past, but we did, sometimes in the name of organizational purity, or organizational arrogance, sometimes because disciplines didn't interrelate to each other, and sometimes because functional managers or functional doers simply lived in their own world and did not make reference to others. 
Most people fail to integrate because it's easier to stay in a single lane. If you've got a cubicle in an office and you only have things come in your inbox and you put them in your outbox, you control how much work you have to do and what you have to be responsible for. When you force people to deal with much wider range of types of information, it's harder work. It's work to coordinate, it's work to integrate. It is sometimes a little bit scary. Now the situation could be anywhere. And often we need that information in our fingertip near real time to be able to take appropriate actions. So the challenges are big, but those challenges can be addressed with the correct focus on integrated intelligence. We have huge opportunities with the advent of cloud computing and the great advances in IT. If we don't take advantage of it and move smartly together, uh, we'll find ourselves more disconnected. I think we have to pay attention to that. It is about an attitude, it is about an approach, it is about an enthusiasm, and it is about a commitment to satisfying that customer's core need, which again is increased confidence at their point of decision, enhanced understanding when they need to act, reduced uncertainty when the trigger gets pulled. I don't believe collaborative integrated intelligence is an option. We must do this. There's great benefit in collaboration, but there's very strong resistance to collaboration and integration up front. Once you do it, and you sample it, you taste it, you know what it's like, there's no going back. Integrated intelligence is a major challenge, but it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity to work together in a collaborative fashion that we never had before. The true value of integration is when you don't even have to think about it. It just happens because it becomes natural. This is the new norm. I've just traveled back from Afghanistan. That's the way our folks are working in the theater of operations. It's in a multi-ant, collaborative fashion. I think we've got a generation of people who are better than my generation. I think we've got a generation of people who are not only going to expect this, they're going to demand this. They're going to wonder why we're not integrating at every level all the time. I think the UBL operation is a outstanding example of collaborative integrated intelligence. I think if the organizations who had been involved in that operation had approached this singly and simply coordinated their information, talked about their information, we may not have arrived at the solution that we did. I'm not assuming we're going to get this right. I know we're going to get this right. This country, our intelligence community, we're capable of remarkable things. No one is a standalone solution. No one has the golden nugget of information that makes America safe. It's going to be all of the pieces, all of the bricks that come together to build a wall that protects us. And even then, it's a nonstop activity. So I think if we are truly operating in a collaborative, integrated fashion, the possibilities of what we can do are limitless. So whether it's a face-off with the former Soviet Union in a Cold War over an extended period of time, or bringing a terrorist mass murderer to justice, this country is very, very resilient. We have the best intelligence community in the history of the world. Take pride in that, but remember, we can make it better. We don't have the option to only defend one spot or one part of America. We've got to defend all of America with all of the pieces that we have to put together, and we can do that.